And we'll uh, wrap up with a discussion on the multi-level inverter at the output of our little box project. Okay, there you go. Okay. So first of all, for anyone that might not know, uh, the Google Little Box Challenge is basically a competition sponsored by Google and IEEE uh, designed to motivate innovations in the field of uh, single phase inverters in particular. And this is partly a you know, philanthropy project by Google, but it also helps when more people in Africa, for instance, have power accessible to them so that they can have internet and things like that. So, so this, is a, this is a project that Google is doing to improve, improve uh, technology in single phase inverters. The major specifications of the project uh, are that we're asked to design a 450 volt DC to a 240 volt AC uh, 2 kVA inverter. And so this is uh, typical panel power levels. Solar panel power levels are probably about 200 watts, depending upon the panel. But just to, that's, so it's, it's a, it's, the project is, you know, is theoretically geared towards a, a solar application, but that's not in any of the specifications. Uh, the interesting uh, test requirement for the converter is that we have a 10 ohm series resistor in line with the DC source at 450 volts. So this is just to uh, verify that we can perform uh, regulation over changing load conditions. Um, our THD for both current and voltage must be below 5%. Our power density is over 50 watts per meter cube, or per inch cubed. Um, and our efficiency is it needs to be above 95%. So just for reference, uh, the solar bridge inverter, the latest version, uh, is about five watts per inch cube. Now granted, uh, it's warranted for 25 years, and it doesn't have about $400 worth of capacitors in it only. So um, we're kind of competing on two different, two different ball games here, but the, the five watts per inch cube is just kind of a ballpark reference figure for a single phase inverter. So the timeline for this project, uh, actually stepping back as well, uh, Professor Kalawa submitted a proposal last fall and uh, basically registering our team. In July, uh, we need to submit our, basically our report for the uh, converter. So we need to have test results and we need to submit our, our current, uh, the current status of our converter. Then in October, up to 18 finalists will be selected to go to NREL to actually uh, test, prove their converters, test their converters over a 100 hour uh, test cycle. And so we uh, look forward to going there. And then the, finally, the, the finalists will be uh, announced in January. So there is a $1 million grand prize, which would be pretty exciting for, for the department, the power group. And um, we've already won one of the 10 uh, development awards that Google issued uh, for, for academic teams. So basically, based on the proposal that we submitted, Google selected 10 teams and gave us, each of us, about $30,000 to fund the, uh, the project. The project uh, or partially Part of the project. Par partially funded. It'll, no, it'll probably fund supplies, most of them. Maybe. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those capacitors I mentioned. Uh, basically, one of the prime challenges in this project, and specifically in getting the, the power density of the inverter down, is simply the fact that if you remember back to uh, 476, there is a twice fine frequency power pull in a single phase uh, line. And so because we are drawing our power either from a battery or a panel, we want to draw a constant DC current from the panel or battery. Obviously, in solar applications, we need to track the maximum power point. And in a battery application, we want to minimize the losses in the, in the battery. So we want to draw a constant DC current. But our output is AC. So our output is going to have a sinusoidal varying current. And our power is going to ripple at twice the line frequency. So the buffer, which 
actually ends up consuming much of the volume in a single phase inverter is going to have to store energy. Uh, well, store energy down here when the power out is less than the average. It's going to have to release that energy when the uh, power uh, out is greater than the average. And so one way to do this would simply be to uh, put a DC link buff, or a DC link capacitor across the input. Now that would be the most efficient, inefficient, because what happens is the, the energy that's drawn from the capacitor obviously causes a ripple in the capacitor voltage. And so in order to uh, reduce the ripple at the input of the converter, we're going to have to dramatically oversize our capacitor. And it'll be very underutilized. So that is something that Shivens is going to talk about momentarily. But first, I'm going to talk to you about some of the tests we've gone through, and specifically uh, ceramic uh, multi-layer capacitors. So we've decided to use ceramic multi-layer capacitors for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, this is the direction that power electronics and inverters is going. For, for reliability, efficiency. In our case, we also are very interested in power density. So ceramic capacitors, unlike uh, electrolytics, which have comparable uh, energy density, uh, ceramics will not deteriorate over time. So an electro electrolytic capacitor will tend to dry out over the life of the inverter. And so that will obviously destroy the inverter. So we've been, we're going to use uh, ceramic uh, ceramic capacitors to basically prove that this concept is sustainable, that this is a legitimate product that could be manufactured. Now, obviously, one of the things that I mentioned is these capacitors, these ceramic capacitors are very expensive, uh, but as they're manufactured more, the price will come down as well. Um, another benefit of ceramic capacitors, as opposed to electrolytics, is that ceramics are far more efficient. Uh, you know, round trip power to power out efficiency. And that's also very important in our application because, as you remember, we have a 95% efficiency target that we need to meet. Um, and then, like I said, their energy, the energy density for the ceramics is, is higher than the, is significantly higher than the comparable uh, dielectrics that we might suggest. You know, with, with Electrolytics out of the picture for reliability and efficiency reasons, we're left to consider tantalum and ceramic and metal film capacitors. And of those, um, this is basically a plot showing a number of different capacitor types. And this is the total volume we would need uh, for, our, for the buffering in our uh, inverter without just, this is a DC bus if like we put a capacitor straight across the DC bus, this is the amount of energy buffering uh, volume that we would need. And so you can see that this, the uh, ceramics are significantly smaller than both the tantalum and the metal film capacitors. So a combination of reliability, power efficiency, and uh, energy density have, has directed us towards using ceramic capacitors. Now ceramic capacitors actually have some challenges. Obviously once you get up, these aren't enormous challenges, but uh, they're just interesting quirks. Uh, there's, there's a couple different classes of ceramic capacitors or ceramic dielectrics that are used. And I'll just mention uh, what's called class one and class two. Um, these are two of the most common and class one capacitors are have a, they have a basically a low uh, relative permeability, so they're not very energy dense. Now the advantage of these capacitors is that they're unaffected by the DC bias that the capacitor is operating at. Um, conversely, if we go to a capacitor that would actually be a legitimate competitor for electrolytics, we go to a class two uh, ceramic dielectrics. Uh, we get good primitivity, but we also uh, have, we also have to deal with a, a, a primitivity that changes along with the DC bias of the capacitor. So basically, this is actually a, a data plot from TDK. And you can see that at zero volts, we have the nominal capacitance of the device. 
And then as we increase the DC bias voltage that the capacitor is operating at, the incremental capacitance decays fairly quickly, like 78% by the time we're operating at the rated voltage. So, so this is going to be a, a challenge when we move into um, actually when we move into actually uh, using these capacitors in our in our buffer. So, um, if you remember back a few slides ago, I, I pointed out the amount of energy that we need to store per cycle in order to effectively decouple the input of the uh, inverter from the DC bus. And in order to use these ceramic uh, multi-layer capacitors, we're not going to be able to use a conventional one half CV square thing to calculate that energy. So instead, we're actually going to have to integrate the energy flowing into the capacitor over a changing value of capacitance. So this is, uh, you know, once we see the, the C as a function of B plot, this was a fairly Normal, normal approach, uh, but we also decided to verify that this piecewise integration that we can get from the manufacturer data sheet would in fact give us an accurate uh, estimation of energy storage in the capacitor. So we did that using uh, this relatively simple setup. Uh, what we basically have here is a is a large DC bias, and this is set for in this the test we've run so far. This is set for half of our AC magnitude. And then on top of that DC bias, we couple in an AC source. And so what this AC source does is it pulses, it sends charge in and out of the, uh, the test capacitor. And then we can use a uh, power meter, basically, to calculate the integral of power in and power out of the capacitor. So this will give us both energy density data, because we can obviously measure the ceramic capacitors. It's also going to give us uh, the efficiency of the capacitors, round trip efficiency. So this approach uh, to someone that's skilled in small signal capacitor analysis might seem a little bit unusual. Uh, basically, there's, there's the uh, dissipation factor of capacitors that you learn about in 464 and things of that nature that are all calculated at a at a certain DC bias point. But what our goal with this test was was to determine the overall uh, dissipation or the overall impedance of the capacitor and the overall uh, energy that was stored in the capacitor over a large voltage swing. So this is the test setup we used to perform this test of the ceramic multilayer capacitors. Uh, the DC DC power source is here. This is the four quadrant AC power source, the power meter, decoupling transformer, and then our capacitors were put in a nice, safe Tupperware box in case we had any explosions. Uh, the actual test fixture uh, was, was little boards just like this one. Uh, you'll notice that those capacitors are pretty small. Ceramic capacitors are currently relatively small uh, devices. There's only, they only go up to uh, a few tens of microfarads at best, uh, depending upon the voltage that they're operating at. So when we get to up to 450 volts, most capacitors about this size are going to be anywhere from 0.47 to 2 microfarads. So in order to get a significant amount of energy storage, we're going to have to couple many of these in parallel and, and work from there. So when we enforce the AC waveform across the capacitors, uh, we also integrated the current, uh, basically the power flowing in and out of the capacitor. And it's immediately evident here that the, what, because the AC voltage is enforced, the uh, capacitance dictates the current that's going to flow in and out of the capacitor. So now if we have a thin film capacitor, like a metal film or a polymer capacitor, where the capacitance is not a value or not a function of DC uh, bias, the current is going to be a phase shifted sinusoidal. But if C becomes a function of B, as you see over in the plot on the right, basically we get almost a triangular uh, current waveform. 
And so this is this is just one of the little interesting things that will happen when we use when we use these ceramic devices. So after we took data on quite a few capacitors over different voltage ranges, uh, we compared those results to uh, different methods of calculation just to verify that when, when we go to design our energy buffer, we'll be in the right ballpark uh, for the energy the wave will store. So if we, if we calculate uh, the energy stored, assuming the constant C is zero bias, you can see that we're 80% higher than the actual measured energy uh, that, we, that we measured in the test. Now, if we calculate it using the C of 450 volts, that heavily derated C, which is like 75% less than the original C, where we significantly underestimate our energy storage. And if we do the piecewise integration, we come out just about right. So, yes, Mark? What if you use uh, 250 not really too? <laughs> it's, not, it's not linear. So, yes, it would be closer. But that's, that would be. It wouldn't be like something you would just apply every time. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it is roughly, roughly linear, but that would be interesting to see. And this is a specific frequency. This is at 60 hertz. This is all at 60 hertz. So I don't have loss calculations in here, but those are all at 60 hertz. The main bus capacitors have to be rated 450 volts, and so we have we also we've also tested some that are lower voltages, um, different results. But these were all tested at 450 volts, like this step. So they actually, because they're nonpolar, we can actually run negative 450 to 450. Uh, but these were just tested zero. But the capacitors are rated for 450? Yes, they are rated for 450. Actually, I don't think that data got in here. Um, there was talk in our group of, of like undersizing capacitors, you know, actually using underrated capacitors. And the interesting thing is that I'll show you in a second. Um, well, I'll just wait until I get there. But it, it turns out that it's not going to be beneficial significantly to underrate them. It's just not worth investing with. So does the operating temperature affect the capacitance? Yes, but not nearly as much as the voltage. So that is another factor. Uh, it all obviously affect losses as well. Uh, so some of that, I think we're going to kind of hope for the best. Uh, we may do a few more tests, but it, it shouldn't be, should be too significant. I've lost. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned, um, these test results also do verify the, the density of the ceramics as opposed to the thin film capacitors, which would be a comparable solution in terms of lifetime and efficiency of the devices. Basically, this is a plot of energy density stored by the capacitors versus the capacitor quality factor, which can actually be simplified to just be you know, the energy that you pull out of the capacitor at the end of a, of a round trip cycle versus the energy you supply to your capacitor, basically an efficiency. And so, and then, yes. And then the, um, the frequency is also part of that, but this is what it's proportional to. And so uh, we can see that the, the thin film, these, these Kemet film capacitors are significantly lower than any, any of the ceramics. Uh, and we also, at that point, noticed that this new uh, dielectric that's been produced by TDK, this X6S, uh, has some pretty remarkable results. And there's only, uh, I think, like three different capacitor voltages that are produced with this X6S material. And uh, going back to your question, Alex, this is why, or was it that? This was, I'm sorry, Ben. 
this is why um, we decided that we're just going to be using 450 volt rate capacitors because when we compared the energy density of these XXS 450 volt rate capacitors, even at uh, 200 volts, like twice over rated, if that makes any sense. So if we if we were if we were comparing if we were selecting capacitors for a 200 volt rating. Um, and we compared these 450 volt devices to something that was rated 200 volts of another type that we could that we could obtain. Um, these still came out ahead, so we're just going to be using the X6S uh, as much as we can when they're available. Um, so uh, now Shivan is going to talk about uh, more, give you more detail about the. The power buffering stage, because like I said, we're not going to put just put a, a chunk of capacitance across the DC bus. We're actually going to do something a little bit more intelligent. Than that. Uh, so uh, next, I'm going to talk about uh, how. Can we actually put this capacitors uh, in combination with like a, a buffer a, a auxiliary circuit to actually make this inverter even more energy dense? Because simply as Chris said, simply putting the mass capacitor you know, there in the conventional way does not meet uh, the energy density uh, requirement. So we still have uh, need to leverage some control method to further uh, increase the utilization ratio of the capacitor. And uh, so that we can actually meet the energy density uh, specs. Uh, so again, uh, just to uh, refresh the memory a little bit. So we have this uh, uh, instantaneous power imbalance, uh, such that we need uh, in a inverter system we need a like an energy buffering, energy temporary storage element to absorb instantaneous power difference. Uh, and as Chris said, this, the apparent choice will be capacitor uh, because capacitor has way higher energy density than uh, inductors. So this is basically an energy density plot, uh, basically showing a similar result. Uh, the blue ones is the energy density of selected capacitors, while the red dots are uh, the energy density of uh, common inductors. So. Uh, we have to keep in mind that, like basically, capacitor is typically three, at least two to three orders of magnitude higher uh, in, in terms of energy density. So, uh, basically, this uh, this uh, temporary energy uh, storage uh, requirement is met uh, conventionally by a simple DC bus uh, capacitor, uh, which we put a really huge uh, capacitor in parallel with the, the DC source. Uh, so as we talked uh, before, the energy store storage requirement is really imposed by the output waveform, uh, which is stressed here. Uh, it, it's basically determined by the output power level and the line frequency. So uh, a common way to shrink the uh, converter size in part electronics is to leverage the switching frequency. But that uh, kind of uh, method does not really apply here because uh, the energy storage requirement here is actually constrained by the line frequency, which is 60 hertz fixed. So we actually have to think about um, other ways to utilize the uh, capacitor more effectively. So this equation describes the uh, energy storage uh, uh, actually performed by the capacitor. So uh, basically, you see this V max and V min are the maximum and minimum uh, voltage across the uh, DC DC bus capacitor within a cycle. So, uh, for the same energy storage requirement, we want this value, this maximum minus minimum, to be as large as possible, such that for the same E, we can reduce the capacitance. Uh, so. But basically, this term represents the ripple on the DC bus. So uh, for most of the applications, uh, we typically have a contradicting requirement on energy storage and uh, DC bus voltage regulation. 
So if we want to store uh, more energy and better use the capacitor, we have to increase the DC, uh, DC side ripple, which will actually compromise uh, other performance. So, uh, so there is like a, uh, this contra contradicting uh, requirement on this. And uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, if we consider the requirement of little box, we have a two kilowatt inverter and we have a 400 volt DC bus and we only allow 3% ripple, which is 12 volt on the DC bus, then to fulfill uh, the energy storage requirement, it will basically need 1.1 uh, millifarad capacitor, which can be really huge. And uh, conventionally, this uh, such large capacitor is provided by an electrolytic uh, capacitor. So here I'm just showing an example. As you can see, uh, that electrolytic capacitor definitely dominates the size uh, of the entire inverter. And uh, there are other, uh, as Chris said, there are other reliability concern uh, for electrolytic capacitors. So Basically, what we're actually exploring is that uh, can we use advanced control techniques and uh, to actually uh, allow this term to become larger while we still maintain a reasonable bus voltage and uh, uh, reduce the capacitor requirement at the same time. What modulation technique has been assumed for 400 volt DC to 240 volt ACRM? What modulation technique has been assumed? Uh, assume you mean is it this, uh, the regular square PWM or sine PWM or space specific? Uh, sine PWM. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically we, we, we want to make this buffer kind of independ independent uh, from the inverter design. So I guess uh, here it's safe to assume uh, we use a very simple high frequency, like, like PWM, like H bridge. So, yeah, so basically um, the basic, basic idea uh, for, for the energy buffer is that instead of directly uh, put the decoupling capacitor uh, to the DC bus, we actually insert a buffer capacitor uh, in between such that we can control the converter to, discharge, to charge and discharge this capacitor uh, with larger swing, but still maintain a, a reasonable a DC bus voltage. So shown, uh, well, shown in, in, in this figure is basically the energy uh, utilization ratio as a function of the ripple across the capacitor. So what energy utilization ratio means uh, is the ratio that the capacitor actually store and release within a cycle over the, the average or, or the maximum energy it actually stores. So if you have a really slow, a small ripple as a conventional DC bus capacitor, you are only using a very small uh, percentage of the uh, total energy potential of the capacitor. So here, what we're exploring is that can we uh, actually use converter to discharge it more, so we can actually be on the this end of the the, the class. So. Uh, 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 correspondingly, if you increase the energy utilization ratio, you can actually, for the same energy storage requirement, you can actually reduce the uh, capacitor volume. So, um, but the problem with with uh, this technique is that uh, this converter actually is connected directly to the DC bus. So actually, uh, it, it it has to be rated for the full DC bus voltage and power. Um, which can actually end up in quite significant uh, converter size because if you consider uh, the size of the switch and especially the magnetic component of the converter, it can actually completely offset the benefit you gain uh, from reducing the capacitor size. So uh, to solve that problem, what we propose uh, is a circuit structure <coughs> like this. So instead of inserting the converter between the energy storing uh, capacitor and the DC bus. We actually configure the converter to act like a, a controllable current source and put it in series with the, uh, with, with the energy storage capacitor. So what this converter does is that as you charge, so basically we reduce 
the size of the main uh, bus, uh, energy storage capacitor such that it will swing more, but it will kind of compromise the DC bus ripple requirement. And to uh, fix that, we actually put this uh, control uh, current source here. And the voltage across this control current source will change according to the change of uh, C1 voltage. And it will actually go to the opposite direction, such that the sum of these two voltage will be a constant, uh, such that we can both allow higher swing on C1, so we can store more energy on it, while we still uh, will we still maintain a reasonable bus voltage. And another benefit of this structure is that this, this circuit is actually not directly connected to the DC bus, but actually uh, is kind of like interface through this capacitor, which means the voltage across uh, this capacitor, oh, sorry, this converter can be uh, much smaller, so it has uh, less voltage stretch. And as we will show in a later slide, it actually possesses uh, less power compared to uh, the conventional solution in the first slide as well. Uh, yeah, so this is basically showing the like the control uh, and operation of the this structure. So, uh, so basically, uh, showing this figure, the the uh, black curve is the output current that is required by the inverter. Uh, and the blue one is actually the average uh, current, uh, which is also equals to the DC side current flowing in, the, in this direction. So um, if we apply KCL here, uh, if we make this uh, the current in this buffer branch to be exactly the difference between the DC uh, current and the inverter current, uh, shown as this uh, right one. If we make this current exactly that, then according to KCL, there will be no current flowing through the bus capacitor. So we can basically make this bus capacitor really small, small just to absorb some switching transient. Um, and it will, not, it will not, not actually cause any ripple on the, on the bus capacitor. And to actually enforce that current uh, in this branch, so we actually measure uh, the output current, and we actually perform a band, path, uh, band path filtering, and then we use this reference to control. We do a uh, we do a current history. This is control. So that basically means we generate two uh, bounds for uh, the converted current, and like depending on uh, where the actual inductor current is, we actually bounce between these two limits. So the average of this converter current uh, will be exactly what we want it to be. And as a result, uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, black curve, C1, is the voltage across this capacitor. So uh, it's actually allowed, uh, if you notice the y-axis, so it's actually allowed a much higher swing. It's basically around uh, 70 volt uh, plus and minus uh, sorry, 400 volt plus and minus 70 volt. So it's a much larger ripple on C1. Um, and actually, uh, C3, the voltage on C3 actually add uh, exactly to the opposite direction, uh, such that the sum of these two actually add up to the bus voltage. So as you uh, notice, the y-axis is actually, the range is much smaller. So it's almost a ripple free bus voltage. Uh, near the 400 nominal value. And uh, last, lastly, this plot basically show the uh, power that is instantaneous power that is actually uh, processed by the converter. So for a two kilowatt inverter, the buffer only process uh, less than 200 watts. Uh, even the peak power is less than 200 watts. So that basically uh, represents a very small converter size. So uh, here, just for the same example we have calculated before, here is just showing the uh, component value of this proposed uh, buffer structure. So uh, if you remember before, for the main capacitor, we need 1.1 uh, millifarad. Now we can reduce it to only one-tenth of that value. Uh, 
Um, and other components, all other components, supporting capacitor, filter, inductor, these are all uh, the, the overhead to actually uh, use this structure. So uh, it looks like, it, it seems that the support capacitor C2 is actually quite large, for example. But if you notice that this C2, um, in this previous uh, uh, plot, C2 is actually at a very, uh, at a much lower voltage. So when you actually uh, use a capacitor at a much lower voltage, the capacitance density actually go much, uh, go much higher, which means the volume of this 250 microfarad capacitor at lower rate of voltage is actually smaller uh, than the main capacitor. And also, um, you can see we actually use a quite small inductor value, uh, etc. So um, uh, eventually, as uh, I will show later, the overhead of this is actually still smaller than the main capacitor use. Um, so a particular challenge uh, for, for uh, like due to the use of this structure is that there are going to be power losses in, in this converter. Um, so when you actually need to pull extra energy from the bus to compensate any power loss uh, within this converter. But at the same time, any, any energy you try to pull with this capacitor <coughs> has to go through C1 because they are connected in series. So um, because C1 is actually almost loss free because it's like a ceramic capacitor, the loss is very small. So basically compensating uh, the power loss in this converter may actually result in overcharging uh, the, the uh, like over, overcharging C1. So uh, it actually requires a special control technique to, to actually compensate that. So I'm not actually going to into detail about how all uh, is actually achieved, but that's actually uh, completely verified in simulation. So uh, here is just like the, showing the, the simulation result. So from time zero to around uh, t equals to 40 micro a millisecond. So we basically have no compensation method in place. So as you can see, C2 voltage is actually dropping slowly because of the loss uh, in the power. So it does not actually absorb all the power it is supposed to, to absorb. Um, but once at, at this time, once we actually enable the compensation scheme to actually, uh, C2 voltage is actually well regulated and it can go back to the, to the nominal value. Um, well, we look at the uh, this is C1 voltage is actually unaffected during this process. Uh, it it may maintains its average value. Um, and also, there is a similar kind of um, a voltage compensation scheme for, for C1 as well. That's primarily used for load transient. So, if your in inverter current step up or, or step down, um, there are also a scheme to compensate for that. So, here I'm showing near. Uh, time equals to 5 millisecond. Um, so there's a low transient. As you can see, uh, the entire system actually maintain like a stable operation and, and settle to the new steady state pretty quickly. So uh, that's the, the control we're actually implementing. So here is the uh, preliminary power prototype where we are actually doing. So, uh, well, actually, this this should be C1. This should be C2. I forgot to. Do you think the control strategy all proposed is unique? Do you think other designs are using? Well, I I will say, they. You mean like, and any other team they will actually come up with something similar? Yeah. Yeah. No I, think, <laughs> I think so. Well, I I really think it's not that difficult to, to think of this, but I think it all comes down to. To specific I think it's more like an implementation challenge. Say, for example, I mean, this structure is easy to, to think of, but I think this compensation scheme is kind of like a brilliant. brilliant <laughs> <idea>. <laughs> there you go. So they might actually get it. You know, 
something of this sort. But I mean, another obvious way to do this conversation is that you connect another converter from the bus directly to C2 to kind of compensate the, the power loss. But that will that will require extra power. It's not as neat as this. Yeah. So, well, yeah, actually, as, as I said, oh, this, two, this should be C1, this should be C2. So basically, still, the, the main uh, capacitor actually takes up most of the, 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 the space. And all the switches, inductor, uh, and support capacitor, like the overhead to, to implement the structure. So uh, as we can remember, C1 is actually like one tenth of original capacitance size. So like overall, basically, if, even if you consider the overhead, this is still like one fifth or one fourth of the original. Like if we use a conventional solution, yes, this is actually a, a much smaller uh, design. Uh, but so far, uh, it only works in simulation. So <laughs> much work needs to be done to actually make it fully uh, work. What do you have any ideas for? Why is that work in simulation? Uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just life, life is hard. <laughs> so if, if your advisor asks you why this work, you just say life is hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, because we are actually using uh, like uh, the new Gamma Nitride switch, which is very like fragile. Like it only works in the well. Plus, I actually made some S switches power. Actually, I actually made some some mistake in the, in the layout as well that you know, partially contribute to the failure. Of this device, but yeah. they weren't mistakes. They were first and revision or like, well, well, yeah. So basically, the new guy and I find the switch. I think is still in its preliminary uh, stage. So it's not as like it, 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 it has high performance, but you can it, it breaks easily. Like it does not really allow you to make to make like mistakes. So I guess that's what I learned. So if you want to use the you know, Gallian Nitrate, again. So should we, um, okay. uh, the simulation results that you showed, were they for the, the average signal model, or was it for the, the real switching model? The real switching model. So uh, the reason I'm kind of confident that this will work is because this, like you see this ripple on the, on the bus, this is like a non-ideal situation because all the measurement here, I basically uh, simulate the effect of uh, AEC, like sample and hold, like I assume a 20 kilohertz switching frequency here. So basically the signal you measure here before it actually be used for, for control, there is actually like a 20 kilohertz AEC delay, a delay associated with that. Um, like, and I also kind of include power losses, etc. in the signal. So I think it's quite close to the uh, real situation. So and uh, the hysteresis band is about two amperes for five ampere uh, uh -huh. AC current, right? Uh -huh. That seems to be quite big. So yeah, yes. How? What was the reasoning behind coming to that particular width of the band? Uh, well, it's basically a trade-off between how how large uh, how large capacitance. Oh, uh, sorry, inductance. You, you, you need. And there's like a balance between, like it's basically the higher higher current band you have, like the slower switching you can like for. It's basically the relation between inductance, switching frequency, and like the, the current RMS rather. Are you looking at the average switching frequency, or is it the instantaneous switching frequency? Because this is obviously going to change the switching frequency yes. change over time. Yes, yes. And so, are you trying to restrict the average switching frequency, or are you trying to restrict the instantaneous switching frequency? Uh, well, in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm not actually restricting. Like the frequency can be whatever it, it needs to. It's basically we want to change all these values to minimize the loss. So. Um, they, it's, it's easier to implement if we just kind of enforce a, 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 a constant band, current band. So the frequency may change a little bit depending on the, like where it is, but it's actually easier to implement. So that's why I choose like a constant current. Okay. So 
So indeed, like the frequency is actually slower here, but it's actually faster at the top and bottom. And there was a fundamental reason that you couldn't use a small signal model. It was that you couldn't use PI control for the current. Well, the yeah. use hysteresis control. So I, I tried PI control before, but the, the challenge here is that uh, because it's actually working in, in a directional situation, and you also have like a there's basically on one side of the converter you have a quite large capacitor but no load. There's no designating like no resistor at all. So if you can work on the small uh, signal model, there's actually a very low frequency pull depending on the the current. So that you know that that pull may be oh, sorry not not right half plane zero. Very low frequency right half plane zero. That might actually be way slower than 60 hertz. So then the entire like PI control cannot really is, is difficult to, to stabilize. We still have you. Yeah. So yeah, you do. If you have any questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I will talk about the actual DC to DC conversion part. Okay. So, so I think there has already been a extensive research on the DC to AC conversion in the past 30 years. I think probably too much. So I think it's really hard to come up with um, innovative technology or innovative control. Right? I think it's probably not even worthwhile to come up with one. <laughs> I think. I mean, Many times, the new things are not necessarily better. So, 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 so we decided to really to pick from the existing technologies and try to find one that is most suitable for this project. Uh, so, so first we looked at the uh, just the simplest form, simplest form of full bridge inverter. So it's just function much like a buck converter. So there are two parts of a DC to AC conversion. One is want to flip the polarity. At 60 hertz, the other is you have to follow the sinusoidal waveform. So, so for this full bridge, uh, if you want a positive output, you turn on this switch, and you pick up on these two switches, and you change the duty ratio of these two switches so that the output follows this sign. Uh, and if you want a negative output voltage, you turn off this one, you turn on this one, and you pick up on these two. So because it's really simple. It works like a bulk converter. We can actually calculate the inductance needed. This is the formula for a bulk converter. It is obtained from the, that's just the current ripple, uh, similar to what the buffer structure has shown. So at this, so the worst case is D equals to 0 0.5, and these are the specification of the. Uh, so, uh, so the input is 450 volts, and 20, 200 kilohertz is the switching frequency, which is pretty high given this voltage. It's really only possible with the, like the best, uh, newest, get and not high switches. And this delta i is what we chose for a good balance between efficiency and the size of the inductor. So it's two amps. So we calculate the required inductance is 280 amp. Um, Sorry, 280 microhenry. So just to have a sense of how large the inductance is, so this is the Qualcraft SCR3018. That's the largest surface mount inductor that we can find, and that's 22 microhenry. Same. That's the required reading for the uh, for the product, and that's the size. So because we need 280, so roughly if, even if we wind our own inductor. The size of the inductor roughly scales with linearly with the inductance needed. So that the estimated total volume will be 9.6 uh, cubic inch. That's really large. I think for I think it's probably larger than my face. What's the total converter size again? 15. 15. 
50 watts per cubic inch that yeah. comes about 40, 40 cubic inches. 40 cubic inches. Okay. So that one thing, that one huge inductor is only 10 cubic inch. And also, uh, it's not really, it's not only the volume, it's also the height of the inductor, because all the F, all the rest of the circuits are pretty flat on those ICs and switches. Now you have this very tall, so these others are, are flat, but a large area. Now this one is, is kind of a cube. So it's really hard to make a compact uh, box uh, and make use of the space efficiently using these tall components. So we decided to go to look at the multi-level inverters. So these, these are, so the multi-level inverters basically uh, use floating DC sources to generate those intermediate voltages so that you can use lower voltage switches and you can switch faster and possibly have reduced output filter. Uh, so thanks to the ingenuity of all those engineers, we have so many choices. Uh, so, here, so I'll go through the main the major ones. So I highlighted the disadvantage is in, in red and advantage in green. So for the cascading multi cell, basically that is just full bridges cascaded with it, like one after another. And each of them is using a floating voltage source. So because it requires a separate actual DC source, so we don't have that. We only have one single DC source in the, in the product. So that is out of the, that, yeah, that, so we can choose that. And all the rest of the converters they use for their floating voltage source, they can use flying methods. So the, the rest are possible. Uh, the next one is diode clamped multi level converter, basically, it uses diode and flying method to generate that voltage, intermediate voltage, but it really requires high, high voltage diodes. And also, the voltage balancing of those capacitors require uh, extra circuitry. So, we really don't want to go there. And the next one is really popular, is modular multi-level converter that's really used for high voltage like several kV applications. Uh, the problem is the capacitor voltage balancing is active. You have to, you don't need like extra cir converter circuits when you have to use voltage sensing on all those capacitors and uh, regulate them. And also the regulation is done at line frequency, which means you have to use larger capacitors so that at that frequency, the voltage drift is not too bad. Uh, also, it, what breaks the deal is that it cannot produce the output voltage that's outside of the DC converter range. So for example, the DC converter, the, the DC voltage source range. So the DC voltage source is 450 volts. So the peak-to-peak -peak output of that inverter, even though it can be plus minus something, but the peak-to-peak -peak can only be less than 450. But our, the little box specification requires four. 240 AC, that's peak to peak in like 700. So we can't really use that. So we come down to the flying capacitor multi level. So the problem with that is the high voltage capacitors, uh, which is actually fine because the capacitors, as we have shown in the plot, have much higher energy density. So even though they have, even though we require high voltage, but the volume is not too bad. And also they have natural balancing of the capacitor voltages. Which means you can just run kind of an open loop, open loop sinusoidal PW, and those capacitor voltages will balance to what is required. And also, the capacitor charge and discharge at the switching frequency. So, we can further reduce the capacitor size, and also the inductor size can be used to it. So, you can see how many green points are here. So, that's, from, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so this is a simple form of. So this is a three-level flying capacitor multi-level converter. So it has one flying capacitor that's half the input voltage. Uh, so, so this is so this these two are the PWM signal for the, these two switches, and this is the output, the switching load voltage on this before the inductor. Basically, you can see uh, two benefits of this topology. One is that so for a buck converter the Inductor ripple is really from zero to the input voltage, but for this one, you can see that it's actually from zero to half V in, or if you want to have, or it can be from half V in to V in. So the that uh, this voltage ripple seen by the inductor is automatically halved by this multi-level And also, you can see this frequency pulse, this pulse frequency seen by the inductor is also twice the switching frequency of the switches. 
So for this two level, so, so so if you look at the inductor size, you can see that so this is the same formula as before. However, the input voltage now is divided by a factor of n minus one, and the switching frequency is multiplied by a factor of n minus one. So if you imagine if you have a higher number of levels for this converter, the size of the inductor goes down quadratically according to the number of, with respect to the number of levels. So here's a plot of the normalized inductance value compared to with respect to the just the full bridge. Uh, versus the number of levels that we use. So without considering the size of capacitor, it's just if you just look at the size of the inductor, the solid line it show, shows the plot. So we can easily reduce the inductor size by a factor of 10 and more. And however, because those capacitors are high voltage capacitors, so they do require some volume. So we actually copy those volumes and and we actually refer that volume to the inductor volume. By assuming a certain energy density of the capacitor inductor, so we, we can show them on the same plot. So if you consider the volume of the capacitor, you know the volumes are slightly larger than just the inductors. However, you can see you can you can see how very significant increase, uh, decrease in the passive component volume. So here are the possible inductors that we looked into. They have different power losses. I mean. We have low power losses and very high power losses and very low volume and lower power losses and high volume. But even the highest volume is 0 0.4 cubic inch. That's one of 20 times smaller than, than what's, what's required with this, this two level. Uh, yeah. So this is the prototype. So we made a seven level converter. So we so because also the there's also the overhead of those level shifting circuits and gate driver circuits of the multi level converter. So we think the optimal level uh, is somewhere between five to seven levels. So this is a seven level prototype. So here, each one of those is a half bridge gallium neutron module. And we have six of them. And the ones in the middle are the flying capacitors. And that's the inductor. And these are the level shifters really to power these uh, gate drivers. So the overall size is uh, 140 millimeter times 100 millimeter. And the height of the inductor, if you are, is two for now. The height of the inductor is the highest component. That's the 13 millimeter. We can also have two inductions parallel, two smaller, two shorter ones in parallel, and that will bring down the height to. Seven millimeter, and if if this works at full power, the power density. So this one right now, this prototype, if it works, it will be 180 watts per cubic inch. Uh, of course, this is not optimized layout. I think we can push it much higher if it works at full power. So, so how far have you tested this one? So this one is very low power. Like, very watts. <laughs> However, the efficiency was very high before it was. So this was this was like 99, 98% efficiency. Yeah, I think we break we broke it because of insufficient dead time, and also we didn't have the best practice to solve those gate natural switches. So so since then we moved down. We actually so this is too difficult to make because we spent so much time making the seven level and you know if it doesn't work, it really won't lie. So we made a small like three level converters, which is just a, a subsection of this. And that one we are we were successfully to test to 300 watts. So and we're also getting new product types. So yeah, pretty confident. Okay. So what's the it looks like the gallon nitrate switches are on like their own board? Yes, because they break so easily. Sometimes if you did some really silly thing they 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 decide they do not only they short, they actually explode. And then when they explode, they actually break the path the, on the PCB under them. So if you have this on one single board, if one pad breaks, then you have to throw yeah. the whole converter and build another converter in one moment. <laughs> so that's why we decided to make these modules and we can just replace one module. Cool. Yep, I think that's all we have now. <laughs> Can you just talk to your Instagram? 
these, these three are the three that are doing most of the work. They're responsible for it. I hold them accountable. Uh, the rest, there's a lot, a lot of others are helping out too. With, okay. With sort of certain parts of it. But these three are the guys that will get fired if you don't make money dollars. <laughs> or they will share in the bounty <laughs> in some way. Free pizza. <laughs> Once. <laughs> If you haven't noticed yet, we're putting a few eggs in that GAN basket. That's actually yeah. the, biggest, the biggest challenge right now is these GAN switches. Uh, but that's part of the part of the fun too, for me, not for these guys. <laughs> Other questions? So, are, are you on track to make your Power tool, and you see it big and pretty. Um, yes. <laughs> and I'll say this I think either we'll be a very, very competitive team and have one of the best solutions, or we will not. Know. Right? So, the, the, there's a lot at the end. You know, just making this thing work, but then you gotta worry about EMI and there's transient response and that kind of stuff. I think a lot of people have trouble with that, uh, but we took the approach of we can make something that works, it's kind of conventional, but that's not very fun. Research, these are actually, as much as Shabin thought this was fairly obvious, but that now is it's actually, it's a very nice solution on its own. Uh, so there's several sort of really nice research contribution here, uh, and that's what we were focusing, focusing on. We might as well you know, go big or go home. Uh, so we decided to go fairly, fairly aggressive on the research part of it. Uh, because let's face it, if, if, if you do a conservative design that's just a highly optimized dimensional technique to even second, then you really have nothing to show for it. Because you can't really publish, you could publish it, but it's not it's something really new or exciting anyway. So you didn't win a million dollars. So I sort of hedged my bets. I said, we're, we're either gonna, if we don't win a million dollars, we'll have to make a nice user contribution. Most likely we'll win the million dollars and have made nice user contribution. <laughs> The, the end goal, right? But uh, yeah, it's gonna come down. It's gonna come down to the wire, like everything else in hardware. It's tough, um, but we'll see. It's gonna. That's what the summer is for. These pesky classes are over. It's full time. But I think uh, some of the other teams are are some teams are a little more ahead. Some teams are a little less ahead. So it's unclear. I think a lot of teams will not finish. Period. Uh, there'll be a core of maybe ten teams that will have a a strong. Or for that is my guess. At most, ten. Is there like check-ins, like progress reports, or no. like, so you have no idea like what the other teams are doing? Or yeah. I, I gossip a lot with other professors. <laughs> to be honest, so they do other work. Uh, July is the July we gotta test this thing uh, and probably put a report. But the big the big the big show is in October when you bring this thing uh, to Andrew and they test. Any comments on this like, up to the three months on the topology and researches that they that we showed a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, we, I was familiar with that from before the box. I that was part of my advisor's work back at MIT. Uh, we did a bit of analysis, and then that alone, that's what we started on. So I told you, man, look at this thing and see, can we apply this technique or refine it? And you could, but it's not going to be as optimum size-wise as, as what we've done. Would you agree, Shiba? So I'm glad if they use that technique, I'll be very happy. <laughs> I think they are. All right. Thanks, guys.